Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alina, who have we got on with us today? So Ewan Roger is a medievalist and Tudor historian who's also a medieval record specialist at the National Archives and he's here to talk to us about Chaucer. Hi, welcome. Hi, hello. I'm really looking forward to this because we, uh, well, we don't do enough medieval history and I am totally clueless apart from the slight appearance. Did he make an appearance in The Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger? He did, yeah, 2001, A Knight's Tale. And uh, it was Paul Bettany, right? Yeah, definitely. That's it. So (laughs) that's the only thing in my head I have about Chaucer. So start off, tell us, who was he? So Geoffrey Chaucer was a 14th century English poet and he's probably best known for his work, The Canterbury Tales. Um, But as well as his kind of like writing and his poetry, he was also a courtier, an accountant, a diplomat, and what we would now call a civil servant. Um, And he leaves behind hundreds of what we call life records, which are essentially fragments of his like personal and professional life um, through which we can kind of piece together and try and work out who the real Chaucer was. Um, So that's kind of what I'm really interested in, who this person that kind of creates this epic story who the, the real real guy behind that was. So what about his early life? Do we know much about him? So we don't know much. We know a little bit about his parents um, and their home in London and kind of roughly when he was born, but not much about his childhood. He's probably born around 1342 or 1343 um, in Vintry Ward in London to Agnes and John Chaucer. And so if you don't know where Vintry Ward is now, it's essentially next to Cannon Street Station um, kind of by the banks of the Thames. Um, and we don't have a confirmed date for his birth. We only have an, a later account from 1386 when he told um, a court that he was 40 or more years old and confirmed that he'd been kind of carrying arms since he was 27 years old. For, no, sorry. He confirmed that he'd been carrying arms for the last 27 years. Um, his father was a fairly kind of wealthy vintner, so someone involved in the wine trade and who would go on to become deputy butler to the king. Uh, but we don't know much about his kind of early life, uh, about his schooling, or whether he had any siblings, although there are some hints in later accounts that he may have had a sister. So that's, I mean, it's better than nothing, isn't it? So you talked about him bearing arms. So how is he linked to the Hundred Years' War? So he actually fights in the Hundred, in the hundred Years' War um, in an ill-fated campaign in Reims in 14, uh, sorry, in 1359 to 60. Um, and this is a campaign which is led by the king, Edward III, and the Black Prince to try and take the city of Reim. But they essentially find himself in a long siege and have to abandon it. Uh, but the evidence for his involvement in the campaign is really interesting because we have it in his own words written 20 years after this campaign. So this is that document I mentioned where he states he's over, over 40 years old. And it's part of a dispute in the court of chivalry about the right to who can bear various heraldic arms on their kind of shields and, and so on. And he's involved in the case, essentially giving a deposition that he'd seen one of the parties in the case bearing those arms while he was in France. Um, Although he may not have been the best soldier because his deposition continues and he was so armed during the whole expedition until the said Geoffrey was taken. Um, Essentially, he gets himself captured in a skirmish and has to be ransomed back to the king. Um, So Edward III contributes £16 in March 1360 uh, equivalent to kind of over £8,000 today to ransom him back from the French. I'm surprised he even did that. I mean, he must have been kind of important to Edward, at least, to get him ransomed back. It's it's definitely not... There's a, ho- there's a whole list of people that are ransomed back. Um, so Chaucer is £16. I think the highest is £50. So he's not the most expensive soldier that's been captured. Um, but he's certainly, at this point, he's part of kind of royal households he starts off in someone else's household and starts to move into the royal household so he's he's kind of working his way up the ranks at this point is that when he first appears in the records then so he first appears in the records a little bit before that Mm. so the first mention that we have is from 1357 so um, a couple of years before he's going off to france Um, and that's when he's a teenager in the household of the countess of ulster and line of and lionel of antwerp so he's essentially a household servant or page um, within this kind of high status mm-hmm. household. Um, originally, he's part of just Elizabeth's household, but then later on he moves into Lionel's household. So he's kind of employed by both of them. And we don't have many accounts for that household. We have a few household accounts, which are now in the British Library, but they include some really interesting payments for clothes being bought for him. Um, so he gets a tunic, he gets red and black hose or tights and a pair of shoes. 
Um, and quite entertainingly, in the most kind of recent biography of Chaucer, um, which I'd highly recommend to anyone, Professor Marion Turner has compared this to some of the complaints about youth fashion at the time, which match exactly the clothes that have been bought for Chaucer. So essentially, teenagers at, at that time are wearing these really, really short tunics, which don't cover their bums properly, and these kind of fancy, multicoloured, skin-tight tights, um, possibly tied up in a way to accentuate their genitals. Um, and they actually blame this kind of bad fashion for causing the plague. It's one of the, the few things that are blamed for the plague. That's mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you think of when you think of Chaucer, this kind of teenager rocking around in these um, black and red tights with a very short tunic on. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but maybe, I don't know, maybe that's what brought him to attention. Maybe he looks... <laughs> so he then gets married in 1366. Do they end up having any children? Yeah, so he marries a woman called Philippa de, Ru- de Roy. I don't know how to pronounce it. She's, um, she comes from France, essentially. Uh, Philippa de Roy, Roy um, who's a se- who's, she's also in the royal household at this time. So she's serving as a kind of servant to the queen. Um, and she may well have been, there's a Philippa who's also in the Ulster household at the same time as Chaucer. So it might be the same woman. And if so, then they meet as teenagers in this great household before then moving to the royal household, probably about the same time they get married. Um, and she's probably higher status than him um, by a little bit, but they they clearly kind of meet in this um, household environment. And we know that they had at, at least two children, um, Thomas and Lewis Chaucer, although there are some debates about whether Lewis was actually Philippa's or whether she's from um, a different relationship. Um, but in 1396, we do have some records. So we have a legal record which takes action against one Thomas Chaucer, who is described in the document as the son of Geoffrey Chaucer. So we know that's definitely um, one child. And we have a property deed from 1409 where he actually uses Geoffrey, who's dead by that point, to authenticate the deed. So we know there's definitely a link there. But the other children are slightly more difficult. So there's a record for Thomas and Lewis Chaucer serving together in the army in 1403. Um, and one of Chaucer's works, a treatise on the astrolabe, actually references Little Lewis, my son. So they seem to be one and the same. And there may be a, one or possibly two daughters. It's very difficult to tell. There is an Elizabeth Chaucer, who's nominated to be a nun at St. Helen's Priory in London in 1377, uh, and possibly also at Barking Abbey in 1381. Um, and there's an Agnes Chaucer, who's recorded as a lady, to wait, lady at waiting at Henry IV's coronation. But so little information survives for these women, it's very difficult to tell kind of, for certain. It's like you really do have to extricate like the tiniest sliver of information to try and build up a picture, don't you? Yeah, people have been essentially putting, pulling together these life records for the last 100 years. Um, and we're still finding more and more slivers that you can kind of match together to actually tell this story. That's but it's also very different because names are not like always spelt the same way. So, no, there was like you just mm, they can't even Shakespeare signs his name how many different ways? Yeah, exactly. So Chaucer can be spelt in a whole lot of different ways and it's trying to work out is that the same Chaucer? So the Elizabeth who's the nun, one of the accounts calls her Elizabeth Chaucy, um, which is kind of similar and you have to use a lot of extra background information and documents to try and piece those people together. Yeah, I am not envying you from my 20th century <laughs> pedestal where there are census reserves and things like that. Um, is his relationship, we did a podcast on John of Gorn, is his relationship with him important? It is, yeah, because, um, so, John of Gorn, it, he's the king's third son, he's one of the leading nobles in the land. He's probably also about the same age as Chaucer, so they're very different statuses, but they are kind of growing up in this household military environment together. And they certainly met early on. They may have served in the wars together. But actually, the strongest link between the two is not Chaucer himself, but his wife, Philippa, and her sister. Uh, She actually is part of Gaunt's household. um, And Philippa joins her in the 1370s. And, yeah, proximity to such a wealthy individual is really important because it can be a source of income or patronage. Um, So, for example, he gets an annual annuity of £10, so so an annual gift from Gaunt, uh, which is described as being in consideration of the services rendered by him to Gaunt and by Philippa to Gaunt's mother and his consort. And this is just one of the royal kind of gifts that he picks up throughout his career, but it's quite an important one. Um, my favourite one of his gifts is in 1374, when he actually gets granted a pitcher of wine, 
uh, which is probably about a gallon of wine, um, to be redeemed each day at the Port of London. Um, and he gets that from 1374 right the way through to his death, although it later changes into an annual allowance of wine. Now, we've got no idea how that much drinking that much wine per day may have influenced his writings, uh, but it's been suggested that it was a gift to him for part of the annual St. George's Day festiv- festivities. Um, patronage is more difficult to assess because there's no doubt that his relationship would have been profitable, but it doesn't often leave records behind. Um, and most interestingly, they actually become brothers, brothers-in-law because Gaunt actually married, marries Philippa's sister in the 1390s. So he's making his way up, basically. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's making his way through these royal households. He's kind of doing this service. Gaunt's a little bit later. Philippa is more kind of linked with Gaunt's household at first. But by 1374, they're definitely um, kind of linked a lot more. So at this point, he, um, he just he starts to travel a lot, doesn't he? Um, yeah, so this, he travels widely. Is this where he gets introduced to poetry? It's hard to say. He, tra- he definitely travels across Europe a lot, um, generally in crown service. So between 1372 and 1373, he goes off to Genoa and Florence to negotiate some commercial agreements and probably also to try and secure loans for the English crown. Uh, But he also travels to Flanders, France, Italy, um, negotiates peace treaties between between England and France, um, and he's described on several accounts as conveying the king's secret business. Um, And we also know he goes to Spain, so he's clearly experiencing lots of different styles, cultures and individuals. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether he met kind of prominent European poets and writers of the time, so Boccaccio, Petrarch. But unfortunately, we don't really have that information recorded. So his account, the accounts and documents that are produced are very much um, paying him for his journeys or accounting for his costs while on journey uh, rather than who he's meeting. But I'd say he's definitely going to be introduced to new styles, new European uh, concepts, um, but it's also worth mentioning that he would experience a lot of poetry, literature and culture, both within the royal household, which is one of the grandest in Europe. They have absolutely mad parties every year um, and also in the Ulster, Ulster household. So it's certainly not something he can only find in Europe. It's probably just a different style, a different influence that he finds out there. You know we're going to segue onto this. Why are the parties mad? They... <laughs> Edward III really likes a tournament or a kind of big chivalric party, um, often to do, he, he founds the Order of the Garter at Windsor Castle around this time, and so every year you have kind of garter feasts, um, and <laughs> there's a lot of accounts for Edward buying costumes for everyone to wear, so there's one account where lot, um, he, he buys, I think it's 10 to 20 monkey costumes for people to wear, and people actually dress up as monkeys or just as peacocks and could have put on these grand shows. Um, and all of this is stuff that Chaucer would have been picking up um, later on while he's, at, while he's at court. I really want to go to a party dressed <laughs> as a monkey now, a medieval chivalric party <laughs> where everybody is dressed as a monkey, even though the woke contingent would go absolutely skipper, <laughs> wouldn't they? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when does he start writing? So his first kind of major work is dated from around around 1368 or in the years just after that. Uh, and it's called The Book of the Duchess, and it's written to commemorate the death of Blanche of Lancaster, who's John of, Warn's, John of Gaunt's wife, um, who dies in 1368. And he, he might have done some translations or some short pieces before that, but the whole issue of dating these documents is really complicated. Um, so that's when he kind of starts, and it's often said that in the 1370s and 80s, that's when he really kicks on with his writing. And there's a really interesting line in one of his works which kind of accentuates this. It's in a work called The House of Fame, which is sort of a dream poem where he's led around a glass palace by an eagle, um, looking at famous deeds and characters from the past. But one of the lines he puts in there is he writes, For when uh, thy labour done all is, and hast made all thy reckonings, so he's talking about accounting here, instead of rest and new things, thou goest home to thy house and on, and also dharma's any stone, thou sittest at another book. So he's talking about working all day. This is uh, probably at the customs house when he's doing this. Um, and then going home to work on these kind of literary feats. The Canterbury Tales. Everyone knows it. I'm assuming everybody out there knows it. Um, it's speculated that the knight was based on Sir John Hawkwood. First of all, is this true? And is this how he finds his influence through the people he meets? So 
there's been a lot of discussion and debate over the centuries about Chaucer's inspiration for the characters, um, including in my own work. And it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that we can kind of put these ideas about inspirations out there, but there's always going to be that mix of between, in any fiction work, there's going to be a mix of literary tropes, literary styles, embellishment, alongside those real-life experiences. So it's really difficult to unpick. And particularly in the medieval courtly um, environment, there's a lot of really strong literary models being used around Europe. And while Chaucer does like to play with those models and sometimes subvert them, there is a literary structure that he's copying and using. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how far I agree with the idea of Sir John Hawkwood as the inspiration for The Knight's Tale, in part because Chaucer's own experiences in Europe and in the royal household, as well as the widest of Arab culture of the time, would have given him loads and loads of possible inspirations for knightly characters. We do know that Chaucer and Hawkwood met in Lombardy in 1378, so it is possible that some of those traits are drawn from Hawkwood. But I think that kind of argument that Terry Jones made about Hawkwood as the inspiration was kind of looking more at the literary style of the knight's tale rather than necessarily digging into those life records to make the case. But we do know that some of the figures were definitely more grounded in real people and real events. So we know the host of the Canterbury Tales, um, a man called Harry Bailey, he is a real individual in medieval Southwark. Um, and that's the location where inspiration for other pilgrims might have come from as well. Um, so I do think there's more to be said about reassessing these characters and the kind of real life Chaucer, uh, particularly as access to archival collections has really increased since these kind of early speculations. People got very, very carried away originally trying to identify characters. And I think now we've kind of reset and we're rethinking it in a much more archival way to try and identify these, these figures. I've got to ask you, why is the Canterbury Tales so important and what's your favourite story from it? So it's probably his best known work um, and it tells this story of a group of pilgrims travelling from London to Canterbury who have a storytelling contest to pass the time on their way. Um, and I really like it because it's a way of producing these characters who are in part a pa uh, parodies, in part they're kind of social commentary um, and in part they might be his, insp his inspirations. But I think the idea of these people telling their stories is a really uh, interesting one and it's a way that that you can kind of live you can kind of ex um you can empathize with some of these characters and their situations um some of them are very funny these stories so i think it's just a really it's a good good compendium of stories pulled together in one piece my favorite one is actually one of the least well-known ones which is mm -hmm. the canon's yeoman's tale uh, because I actually never, ever planned on working on Chaucer, but I got drawn into this life records world by trying to um, disprove one of these previous conjectures. So there was, a, there's been a case made previously that the Canon's Yeoman's Tale um, was actually based on a real life case of um, counterfeiting by alchemy in the highest court, legal court in the land. Um, so the story of the Canon's Yeoman's Tale is essentially a priest working an elaborate uh, alchemical swindle on a victim for financial gain. So he turns up in the Canterbury Tales. He's not one of the original pilgrims, but he catches up with a party a few miles from Canterbury. Um, the yeoman essentially, um, so the, the canon's servant, tells his master's story after the canon um, is outed as an alchemist and runs away in secret. Um, so the second part of the tale, which is the part I'm really interested in, is about the canon... Um, who's a, a priest, convincing a London priest of his skills in changing base metals into gold and silver and cons him into paying £40 to learn how to do alchemy. But essentially, the, the priest, it's all, um, what's the word? It's a, it's a complete con. Mm. He's, he's got um, metals hidden in, other, in kind of his um, cane, his kind of stick. He has things hidden in his sleeves. So he basically cons this guy to pretend that he's, changed metal into gold and silver gets paid for it and then disappears and the guy can't reproduce the alchemical trick because it was never alchemy in the, in the first case so what people gets? found this <laughs> <laughs> so people found this story um kind of at this, in, in um a while ago and they identified that this is really close to this legal case um and they got very very carried away and overexcited and they thought 
Chaucer's been learning alchemy. Chaucer's been conned by an alchemist. This is his revenge. Um, and it's not, it's not really true. So the legal record talks about someone called William de Brumley. This is a case that um, I think the Canons Yeoman's Tale is based on. So this guy, de Brumley, is a chaplain. Um, he essentially gets caught red-handed trying to sell counterfeit coins to the master of the Royal Mint at the Tower of London. Um, and it's claimed that he'd made these coins using alchemy, using gold, silver, and other medicines. And he claims he's been taught this um, by a priest at the King's Chapel at Windsor, and he's actually been successful in selling this alchemical metal before. But he tries to do it again, and he's unsuccessful, and he's arrested, with the alchemical coins being seized as evidence. Um, so I was originally working on St. George's College in Windsor, which is where this priest apparently comes from. Um, but the problem was that the priest's name has been absolutely mangled, both by the original clerks in the 1370s and then misread by historians later on. Um, essentially, the priest's surname, which is Whitchurch, had been written by the medieval clerks as Shitchurch, uh, either deliberately or by mistake. Um, <laughs> and then that's then read as, in the 20th century as Shoe Church. So basically, they didn't realise that these guys could not have been experimenting with alchemy because Whitchurch had been dead for several years by the time Chaucer was working there. Um, so I kind of went to try and dig into this story a bit more and try and discount it, essentially. But then I looked at the legal record more, and I realised there was actually an obvious link between Chaucer and the record. Uh, because in the trial, there's these two juries, and one of them is a group of expert witnesses. So these are like financial professionals who know all about coins and how much they're worth. Um, and they value the coins, um, and actually one of them goes further. So he, he actually takes these coins away at the end of the trial and acts as a surety um, under a penalty of £40 for de Brumley's future good behaviour. So he's essentially bailing him out, and if de Brumley goes on to do more alchemy, he's going to be, um, this, this other guy, John Norwich, is going to be in, um, called into, into court for it. And so that was really interesting, particularly because John Norwich, who's this witness who takes the coins, he is the collector of customs in the Port of London. Um, and in 1374, just as this trial is kind of winding up, Chaucer is about to start working at the customs house, uh, auditing those their financial accounts. So there's this direct link between these, these alchemical coins and Chaucer in the customs house. And so I suspect that what's happening here is rather than a kind of character inspiring a story, you've actually got this kind of cautionary tale because Chaucer's having to learn how to spot dodgy coins. And if those coins are in the customs house, that's a really interesting story that kind of Chaucer can ask people that are there about um, and develop this working knowledge of how coins um, are made. Um, so he kind of, I would, I would argue, he kind of takes this core of a story and then uses his literary talent many years later to turn it into this literary tale. Um, but it does also reflect some of these experiences from both Chaucer and Norwich because so in Chaucer's tale, the victim is paying the sum of £40 to learn the secret formula, and that's the same sum of money that Norwich is being, has to offer a surety um, at the end of this case and when he takes those coins away. So I think there's this very strong link. I think a lot of what the Canterbury Tales are is kind of Chaucer's interests, and he's, he's, he's writing these stories for a market. Mm. So they have to be stories that are interesting to people in his, kind of, in his circle because that, they're the people who are likely to be wanting these, wanting these stories. You've already mentioned a bit about his time at Customs House. Can you tell us anything more about that? Yeah, so his time at the Customs House is, I think, the most interesting part for me, because this is a really interesting, metropolitan, um, exotic environment, because you've got, um, he's working in this environment, you've got goods coming in, to London from around the world, and he's going through these accounts every single day. Um, and there's one really interesting part of this is that, and this is, this is a kind of character that I'm wanting to look into more and more um, as a part of a project I'm working on at the moment, um, because there's a character or an individual that appears in these accounts several times um, who's called African Peter. And he's one of the merchants kind of involved in this trade, and he appears in Chaucer's accounts. Now, we don't know... Um, where he's from necessarily we just have this name we know he's not um indigenous to england so it's this kind of really interesting environment and this is at the same time when he's writing all of these works and 
you, he must have just seen so many people, goods, um, and interesting things happening around that kind of boundary between London and the rest of the world. That's fascinating. Um, can you tell us about any of his other works? Yeah, so I've, I've mentioned a couple. I've mentioned the Book of the Duchess and the House of Fame. Hmm. Um, and I should say my experience is more on the kind of on him rather than his works. But he does write some very interesting works. So that actually, I've actually mentioned already the treatise on the astrolabe, um, which is when he mentions his son Lewis. And that's essentially a really technical work about a medieval scientific instrument. So it's a very different side to Chaucer. Um, and it's one that also features in the Canon's Yeoman's Tale when he goes off on this long discourse about alchemy as part of the story. Um, and he's kind of naming all of these alchemical um, items, or items used in, in alchemy. So he, it's a kind of scientific almost side to, to Chaucer that we don't necessarily see in the other works. May the 4th, 1380, something happens. First of all, what is it and does it affect his reputation? Yeah, so in May 1380, there's a document enrolled in the English Chancery on the back of the close rolls. This is one of the kind of central repositories of, um, of the English Chancery. And that's quite a common practice with documents that are personally important being copied onto the official government record to ensure their survival. And in this document, it was acknowledged that Chaucer was released from all further legal process by a woman named Cecily Champagne um, concerning what's described as her raptus. Um, further enrolments were made before the mayor and alderman of London to release Chaucer of all actions. But as the case went no further, that's kind of all we have to work from. Now, raptus in medieval ling- um, legal terminology can be construed as either rape or abduction, uh, possibly in, t- in order to pursue an advantageous marriage. And this case has been read in both ways by historians since it was discovered in the 19th century. We don't know much about Cecily. We know that she was probably the daughter of a London baker, um, William Champagne. And abdication of young people in order p- to p- pursue marriage was something that happened in medieval England. And Chaucer's own father had been abducted in the same way by his own aunt. Um, and similar language was used in the legal documents there, although with the word abducted added it. And recent work has suggested it's possible that Chaucer may have been trying to make a marriage for one of his wards. But at the same time, I really don't think we can rule out the possibility that this was rape. And so we, I think we have to think about how we viewed Chaucer in that light. Um, it didn't affect his reputation at the time. Um, in the legal documents, he essentially has his all his powerful mates turn up and kind of act as sureties. But I think particularly now and in recent years, mm. it has, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's made us think differently about Chaucer. It's a bit grim, isn't it? Yeah. Um, why but does it's, he... It's so... Go on, you finish. I was just going to say, it's, it's so uncertain what happens um, because he, Chaucer is very, very good at settling disputes outside of court. Um, it's something that happens quite a lot, but every, almost every time Chaucer is mentioned in a legal dispute, it vanishes the record. So he is very good at settling these kind of, any legal problems outside of court, essentially paying people off, and that's what this is. Um, he's, he's paying up so that this legal process stops. Yeah, it's like if you were that nice in the first place, you wouldn't keep having people start legal things against you, would you? A lot of it's debt. Okay. Um, debt, <laughs> debt happens quite a lot. <laughs> Why does he stop working in the end and what happens to him in later life? So he serves at the um, customs house for about 12 years, just over. And then he retires from both the wool and the, the petty customs, the rest of the customs, in 1386. And this is a, kind of amongst concerns about people being granted these positions for life. Um, he's also just served as an MP for Kent that year. Um, so he's kind of semi-retiring. And then in 1389, he goes on to this new administrative position um, as clerk of the works. So in this capacity, he's responsible for maintaining and any building works at the Royal Castles, so including at Windsor, the Tower of London, among other uh, places. Now, he does kind of maintain a connection with the London Customs House because that's where he gets his money from for these projects. Um, But he does all sorts of different assignments. Um, In 1390, there's a massive storm in the south of England and he's appointed to look at all the walls and ditches between Woolwich and Greenwich, um, which floods quite a lot. Um, he also has to, um, he plants lots of willow trees along the edges of, um, of rivers and so on, tries to prevent pigs from destroying riverbanks. 
Um, and when that storm happens, he also has to deal with the consequences um, because it's, it's blown down 104 oak trees. So he has to kind of sort out the, the aftermath of that. So he's kind of still working in this capacity, in this kind of financial accounting um, capacity. Mm. But that probably makes him a really tempting target for thieves because he's moving around around the country. He's transporting money and valuable goods. Um, and in 1390, he is robbed by highwaymen at a location called the Foul Oak in Hatcham. Um, and he has 20 pounds of the king's money um, stolen from him by someone called Richard Briley. Um, and it's uncertain from the testimonies whether there's one robbery or multiple robberies. Um, it's, it's, it's not really certain. So he gets robbed by this guy who he takes to court. Um, Briley confesses, tries to get out of it through um, judicial combat. So he tries to fight his way out of it in a kind of very Game of Thrones style. Uh, <laughs> but he's defeated and hanged. Um, and all the other thieves are either hanged or outlawed eventually. Um, but this, I, I think this, 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 this incident must have put Chaucer off because he retires not long after this from Clock of the Works. Um, and he kind of goes to a much quieter. Um, we don't know much about him in this period. We've got there's a, there's a few. He keeps him a few roles, but he kind of very much steps back. And he's only in his fifties at this point. Um, but he does, yeah. He kind of stops becoming an accountant and seems to spend more time in Kent initially. Uh, but then towards the end of his life, he kind of comes back to Westminster and he leases a tenement in Westminster Abbey in 1399. Um, and dies and is buried there shortly after. So how how does he die? Because it's not quite as straightforward as you think. So we don't really know. Um, the traditional date of his death is 25th of October, uh, but that is dated uh, 1400. But that's based on a now illegible inscription on his tomb, um, which was recorded in the 16th century. And the tomb itself wasn't that is there now wasn't put up till 1556. So he just, in one sense, he just kind of vanishes from the record without a will or any other evidence for how he dies. Now, there has been a suggestion, but again, by Terry Jones and some others, that he's murdered, um, in, probably in the events surrounding the deposition of Richard II in 1399, or possibly by the new king, Henry IV, and his chancellor, Thomas Arundel. But I don't, I don't really wear this argument. Um, I don't think he's got much to lose from either of them. The argument is based on Arundel kind of saying he's a heretic. I don't, I don't know if I quite agree with that. And Henry in particular actually grants him a new annuity and confirms his previous annuities in late 1399 or early 1400. So it seems unlikely to me that the king would kind of give you this lovely gift and then ask you to be murdered. Um, so I'm not convinced that, that he's murdered. No, it doesn't sound wholly convincing, does it? <laughs> Why I think Terry Jones I... was trying to sell her book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a chance. Why have I got the words in my notes, Johnny Depp? Johnny Depp. So in the news recently, yeah, Johnny Depp um, was talking about counter- counterculture and um, drug addicts throughout history. Um, and one of the people he named, surprisingly, um, was Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, as and describing him as a kind of, I think he was an opium addict and agent of counterculture. Um, now, that's, I think it's highly unlikely. Chaucer actually does mention opium twice in his works, um, but its properties are kind of well known by the Greeks. It's written about in classical texts, as, particularly as a means of making people fall asleep mm. in kind of legendary mythical stories. So, in one work, Legend of Good Women, he does say. Um, if him to drink when he goes to rest, and he shall sleep as long as ever, um, the narcotics and OPs, OPAs, o- OPIES, being so strong. So this is talking about, yeah, someone being, um, taking this, this kind of cocktail and falling asleep. And in the Knight's Tale, a jailer is fed a cocktail of sweet spiced wine laced with narcotics and OPA of Thebes. So narcotics and pure opium of Thebes to knock him out. And it's a shame that never made it into the film because that would have been quite an interesting yeah. um, <laughs> thing to um, But as, we, as we've kind of seen with his alchemical and his astrolabe interests, he's interested in these scientific and te- technical ideas and was confident writing about them. And we see a similar thing in, with medicine in the way he describes certain people and events in some of the Canterbury tales. So he definitely has some knowledge about medicines. But I think knowing about opium in a classical sense and writing about it is a very different 
thing to Chaucer being an opium addict. To, to being being um, off his tits at all times. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, ne- I've never seen any evidence for a thriving opium trade in, in the port of London or in the capital. It's a bit early, I don't think isn't it? Any... <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, so I don't think there's any evidence that he was an addict. Um, there's nothing in the life records. And he spends most of his life as an accountant. So I don't think we can really talk about him as an agent of counterculture except perhaps in the ways he can subvert some of the literature and approaches his literary texts. Mm. I think he was more interested in the wine, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a gallon of wine a day, I don't think you need opium on top of that. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're pretty merry already, aren't you? <laughs> in, in The Knight's Tale, it's actually quite interesting, is I think the depiction of Chaucer in that. So Paul Bettany apparently never, never read any Chaucer before, that, before he took that role on. But I actually think when they kind of the way he's depicted, particularly the way in which they meet him at the start, kind of lying by the side of the road, to me it actually does kind of hark back to that moment when he's robbed in, in, um, at the Foul Oak. So he is this kind of, yeah, I mean, it's not based in, it's apparently based in 1372, exactly. I was looking this up just ahead of this, meet, this, um, this kind of call, mm. and apparently it's set in 1372 very, very specifically, um, because that's when Chaucer kind of is involved in these movements around Europe so they, they kind of said oh yeah it's um we don't know what happens to him so this is what might have happened which is complete nonsense but I still think he's quite he, he seems to me in the film very similar to what the real Chaucer might have been like brilliant thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about Chaucer and giving us an outline of his life and why it's a name we all know because I think a lot of people go yeah I've heard of him and they may say yeah I've heard of Canterbury Tales as well but beyond that they wouldn't know anything and they certainly wouldn't know that Heath Ledger was enacting one of his tales as well so thanks so much no thanks for talking to me Join us tomorrow when we will be talking to Ben Fuggle about the Mosquito Coast. This is uh, Honduras and Guatemala and Central America and Britain, as usual, interfering and imperialism, and it's quite nutty, really. It's a much forgotten uh, area in terms of the British Empire, uh, so we will learn all about that. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe. Don't forget, you can become a patron of History Hack for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com. It will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus and we would really appreciate it as we would love to do so.